for it. It's amazing seeing what goes into it. It's fine, I'm sure. I had a nice little drop. Pretty sunset. Then it was really good. <laughs> Just when you think you might, everybody else has got Jeremy a perfect, said, moment, yeah. really probably not a bad hard. idea to have so a conversation with like him. He's, he's chill now. I'm well versed on how not perfect it is for both of us. How are you? I'm doing okay. Good. What did you guys do? We just hung out at my parents' house. Um, oh, okay. It was good this year because we didn't have James' parents move mm -hmm. to North Carolina mm. earlier this year. So Came out of the Grand Jones. Yeah. 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 So nice good to evening. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to this evening's yeah. City yeah. Council yeah. study session. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, our first item on the agenda is the police building update. And uh, we have uh, Larry Nemo and Donovan Nolan to give us the update. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Uh, we're here. I think we've been a few months since we've done an update, so we thought we'd better get in and get one done here. So um, I brought Donovan. We provided you some information in the packet and of course our, our slide presentation on kind of where we're at so uh, I'll kind of turn it over to Donovan to get started. Get this working okay. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you again for having me. Um, try to make it very similar format to what we've done in the past. Uh, this, the pictures here don't even show the current status um, just because of the speed of the project moving fast too um, but we can talk through that as we go through. Um, Agenda tonight, we'll talk about the construction update, uh, go through where we're at on the budget, and, and then again, the future outlook for the next 30 to 45 days uh, when we come back for the next update. Um, construction update, it's obvious the construction shell is completed. Um, we've got a lot of the exterior brick, as you can see in the lower left corner, uh, being installed. I, you know, I think we're about 70-ish percent complete on that at this point. Um, obviously, the big scope being between the two buildings, we can't, you know, that, that's the slower, slower portion because we only have eight feet to work um, between the buildings. Uh, we've got the roofing is complete. Um, we are dried in. There's areas where we have uh, glazing left out because we still have to bring materials into the building on the second floor. Um, though it's just patching and patching in the windows and framing them in there and, and then we'll be fully dried in there. Um, interior framing is complete on the lower level. It's near completion on the second floor. Um, the MEP rough-in is complete on both levels as well and the drywall finishing is complete on the lower level um, and near completion on the upper level. Uh, the, the painting has started um, and when we say painting it's just your first coat just like you would if you were doing it at home um, and, and then we can go back in and touch up all the markups from all of our subcontractors and everything there. So um, as you can see, the kind of in the background is the uh, <clears throat> interior stair um, right by the break room. Uh, that's, that's the kind of the grand stair for the uh, police staff to go from the lower level to upper level. And the break room is on that upper level. You see a lot of natural light in there because there's a skylight um, that I think there might be a picture in here, maybe not, that shows kind of just lets all that natural light in right into that space to make it more um, better for the staff, a better atmosphere for the staff is the right way to say it. So, um, you, Yeah, the upper left is some skylights. Uh, that, that's in the central uh, patrol area. It, again, keeping the natural light in there just for the atmosphere of the building and the atmosphere of, of the police team. Um, lower left is your front entryway. Um, it's a lot further along now. Excuse me. Um, a lot further along now, so you don't see as much sca scaffolding there, but that kind of gives you the, the storefront that we're getting ready to install in there. Um, the back right, again, is the what I would call, or sorry, the right picture is what the entry will look like. There's a screen canopy that goes in there that'll match the site fencing and everything as in phase two as it gets going, but right where that guy's walking out of is where the new front entry will be for the building. Uh, here is uh, our drone shot. Um, I thought probably the front entry was the best kind of view to give you that, that concept. This was shortly after, um, shortly after this picture on the lower left. So you can kind of see how it's progressed a little bit more. Uh, but you, you, can, you can see how once we enclose it, you'll still have that glazing effect where you can see the stairs on the right in the entry. Um, but this gives you a pretty good concept of how the building looks and its massing 
Uh, I believe on the website there is four or five of these drone photos. That kind of gives you the aerial of all the sides, uh, as usual, as there has been in the past. Um, but it's progressing well out there and, and, and moving quickly. You're not going to see as much exterior uh, progress because everything's inside now. Um, so it, it, other than the cleanup and, and, and final landscaping around for phase one. So. Um, project budget, uh, as you can see, we kind of, I've added a few, little bit more information from the past. We used to just kind of have current budget, committed costs, and cost to date. We kind of shown how the money, pr original project contingency has been reallocated from line items to line items based on the buyouts of where things are happening. Um, and we're still sitting at the $27 million for our overall project budget, which you guys approved last year. Uh, the committed cost, we've got $25 million of it pretty much committed. Um, we're almost there. There's minor scopes still to be bought out. Um, you know, as you can see, the ones that still have the budgeted dollar amounts, we're still pending those and talking through uh, getting designs finalized and procurements finalized. Cost to date, uh, you know, we're nearly 50% in the books. After this month's disbursement, it probably jumps up to 60%, a bigger, bigger bill going in this month. Um, but progressing well overall in the budget, still pretty healthy. I did um, want to show you kind of our forecasted contingency use based on what's remaining. Um, in the original plan, in the original program, we knew there was going to be abatement, but we didn't know what to account for. This 75000 represents uh, with our consultants that we've hired and, and the uh, procurement from our future vendor, which you'll see in, in the near future um, of what that cost will be. And that will come out of that project contingency. Project field changes are really... Um, design clarifications and, and, and code changes that need to happen to make sure uh, things are modified based on <clears throat> the size of the room being different or the layout of, of something happening. Construction, there's always field changes and that's what that's accounting for. There's some uh, future cast in there. There's a, a security glass film. We've been talking with a specialist um, for a, a higher ballistic rating in the glass. This was more of a desire and a, a recommendation that came from um, local fire um, on this, for that north entry or that north facing, facing wall. wall. Um, and this dollar represents a little higher, it represents what the cost would be to um, install that film on all, on all that glazing. We're evaluating if it's the right fix and then, you know, if it's really going to do its justice for the life term of this building as well. And if there's also, in 10 years, all of a sudden we have to replace it again, it, it doesn't, I don't know, you know, what's the value there? So, um, and then the additional soft cost, again, just goes with contingency changes, uh, things like that to make sure we're, ma we're maintaining it. And we're showing, right now we've got about the 67 left with these, uh, again, estimated forecasted costs. So there's still some, some flexibility in there with the two months we have left uh, for the phase one completion and, and phase two is already contracted out by the way too I should say that um, so there's there's not not nearly as much risk there um, because of the abatement piece which is the last piece uh, to really get contracted out and that's kind of the scary scope if you will of finding unforeseen things so um, that's kind of the budget update or that is the budget update um, I can kind of I can tell you what's happening next over the next 30 days I kind of mentioned the drywall finishes already uh, and the painting. Uh, we are finishing our MEP and, and, and MEP, excuse me, is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Um, the trim out for those, we'll start putting fixtures in. Uh, the lights uh, will start hanging. Um, we're going to start putting in the ceiling grid, as you can, you know, similar to what's above us here. Um, the interior gl glazing uh, it, near each office area and things like that. Um, those, those will start getting installed. We've got carpet, I believe, going in this week um, for the lower level in certain areas. Uh, and again, like I said, the lower levels looks really good. Um, and then the second level is a couple weeks, three, four weeks behind that. Um, still some vendor procurement finalization. We've got AV abatement, <coughs> excuse me, IT equipment, move vendor. Um, those four items are I believe on the 17th for approval there, we've got um, everyone, all the, you know, all the documentation around that to, to get what we need um, with, with approved contracts and everything there. So 
they've uh, the vendors have are aware of those dates and we should be good um, as far as the the overall schedule there there has been a delay um, around the security procurement and that moved our because security is um, the last piece for the final inspection that needs to be part of the life safety that has moved our substantial completion date for phase one from February 4th to March 1st um, so there has been a little bit of delay that uh, AMP honestly it doesn't affect anything with the contractor other than getting the final fire approvement uh, approval and and then there's some you know touch up always when you have other vendors getting back into finished spaces and things like that so there's there's minor involvement uh, with the general contractor it's purely getting the security sent the security scope completed and the move vendor won't be coming to council that's only about twelve thousand dollars so. correct yeah um, and then the last piece is, is it's been discussed in the past Fox building planning and design that that also there's there's going to be some information on the 17th for you guys to look at there but uh, that's that's the path, the next piece of the vendor procurement with with this project that hopefully goes hand in hand with phase two based on the efficiencies of of running running the projects at the, simultaneously so um, that's the skinny as usual um, happy to answer any other questions if there's uh, any any progress questions schedule questions budget questions let us know uh, one thing I did want to offer to council is um, if you guys ever want to set up a time where you can come over and actually take a site tour um, we'd be more than happy to get that set up generally after about 334 the contractors are pretty much cleared up so uh, one one Thursday we did two two shifts of the police one early in the morning and one late in the afternoon so um, I did want to make that offer if any of you are interested we could get something set up and and uh, you have to have a vest and a hard hat and glasses but um, we can take you through and that way if you really want to see it um, it's kind of interesting it really is so can we go after a council meeting maybe we'll make the council meeting shorter <laughs> <laughs> maybe before a council meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, <laughs> you're no fool. We'll, have to, we'll have to provide flashlights it's and everything the it's the lighting <laughs> oh sure yeah that's so, what it is but right. um, I did want to uh, uh, I wanted to make sure you guys were aware that we could make we can arrange that so um, and I know the, the police uh, the tours I did with the police were very profitable for them it got them a chance to actually see what we've been talking about all this time you know mm -hmm. and it's all pretty on paper and it looks real nice up there you know even though we have fall trees and summer trees you know but that's okay but it at least gives you some perspective on some of this stuff all right cool. thank you very much um, council member wink thank you mayor Putin. Um, it seems that uh, progress is tracking to to expectations and and we have the appropriate amount of contingencies in place as needed to date so that's good to hear uh, regarding the uh, the north wall security glass film yes. you talked about um, do you anticipate having finished a thorough estimate in terms of what's the, the cost benefit of the approach you'll choose by the 17th you mentioned a few other items being finished by the 17th I'm just curious to know when we can have a look at that I'd love to see the thought and the research you do yeah we've we've worked we've actually gone through maybe four five or six different uh, filming options mm -hmm. um, to to meet that ballistic rating uh, ballistic rating is tough to get um, this vendor we are uh, working with now actually doesn't let the design is and construction industry know about what they do because they sell to specific police and facilities that need it um, because they don't want their as they put it they don't want their design to be uh, uh, they don't taken. want their product to be installed there in certain go. people's houses that are simply trying to protect themselves from other members of rival groups yeah so there's kind there's protection it. protection rights of of what their design is and what they provide um, but we have uh, we have substantial amount of information we're still gathering a little bit more with the design team just to have them confirm and provide uh, their insights uh, based on other projects where we put in uh, ballistic glazing and stuff um, this is uh, this is something that will be installed after phase one completion it, that's that's the intent of it to be uh, kind of a it doesn't have to be installed during construction 
um, it's, and it needs to be warm enough. So it would be something in March and April that the installation would happen, and also based on the timing. They fly in. They're out of state. They fly their crews in, and then they would install it. So we'd have to, that's part of the program, or the process we would include. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Follow-up? Go ahead. And then why only that wall? And forgive me if I because, didn't know that by now. Yeah, the north wall is where all of the staff sit. Okay. Um, and that's your only exposure from public view, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where all the glazing, the glazing on the south wall and the glazing on, well, really the glazing on the, on the west wall is, it's a sally port. There's, yeah. there is a fitness center, but it's all high and you can't get to, you can't really see through it. Um, the big, the big security piece is dispatch. Obviously that, that's the, our main concern of focus of making sure it's ballistic rated there. Um, but the north wall is the one with, with the majority of the glazing. And if we go back to that picture you can see on the lower left um, that is your you know those are all the offices for the for the and securities down on the, the west right. end oh, yep. I mean Perfect. dispatches down on the west end yeah the other key too was as we reviewed the recommendations uh, this spring is the north wall uh, is also very 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 close to the street above yeah. what this one's quite a ways back um, so yep. you know by the time we get the you remember you can see all of that in front so there's a little bit but this one is within 10 feet of the the sidewalk sure, right. and that was what drove the north wall versus all the, the entire building of course thank you mm -hmm. okay any other questions or comments thank you very much thank for you. coming appreciate to present it. we appreciate it uh, it's you. exciting we're getting close let us let me know yeah. if you guys decide you want to come in and do a tour at some point yeah. okay it, we yeah strongly recommend it and it we can really is. we can <laughs> coordinate it within three days if you all decided hey we want to do it on friday okay yeah all right know, so. we'll talk about that okay thank you thank, thank you. you very much Our next agenda item is on the occupational privilege tax and standard definitions. Um, Acting Finance and Administrative Services Director Mar Maria Sabota and Revenue and Sales Tax Audit Supervisor Heather Driscoll are here to discuss occupational privilege tax, standard definitions, and licensing. Good evening. Oh, how Hello. are you? I'm fine, and how are you? Good. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Though? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you for having us this evening um, to discuss these topics. Um, Heather is going to take it from here. <laughs> All right. Like that, she just passes it off super <laughs> quick. <laughs> okay. Great. I didn't drive last time. Okay, I'll let you drive. So uh, we are here to discuss primarily uh, Title IV, Chapter IV, uh, possible uh, revisions, and then an information uh, session regarding the occupational privilege tax that we weren't able to uh, reach when um, I presented on September 10th. Our objectives tonight is to revisit the standard definitions as well as the mandatory business licensing, both of those um, I have previously presented on and then uh, to provide the information for the occupational privilege tax. We'll start with the standard definitions. Um, just as a reminder, the standard definitions is a project that was uh, first started by the Colorado State Legislature. Um, there was originally the Senate, the Senate concurrent um, resolution or, sorry. let me get the accurate name for you. Yes, resolution. And the goal of that was to have um, a straight line sales and use tax agreement, which really would have overruled a lot of home rule authority regarding taxes. And so that was postponed indefinitely and what was adopted was the Senate Joint Resolution um, 14013 which pretty much asked for the Colorado Municipal League 
to do what they had done in 1992 and have all of the municipalities get together and review the definitions because there's just stuff that has changed since 1992. Who would have thought of smartphones and applications? I sure didn't picture it. Um, and so the goal with that is to make it easier for businesses that are operating. Um, and with the definitions, the goal is not to have a change in the tax base. It should be revenue neutral. Okay. Um, <clears throat> ideally, the, um, the standard definitions being the same across all the municipalities will make it easier for businesses that operate in more than one municipality to file, report, and remit the, their local taxes. So the idea is really to be taxpayer friendly and make their lives a little easier. Um, currently, it's uh, last time I was here, it was 39 municipalities had adopted the standard definitions. We're up to actually 45. So there's 26 that are um, still outstanding. And uh, when Marie and I attended the Colorado Municipal League meeting um, last month, we were actually, um, the state was there and they said that they are starting to move towards the standard definitions as well. So that's great that hopefully everybody is going to kind of be on the same page. Um, it's going to be a bigger hit for the state than um, a municipality like us that this is pretty much within what we already have, but it's just a few updates. Would you all like to do questions after each section or at the end? I'm flexible. Um, doesn't matter to me. Okay. I would like them at the end. Just that works for me. I am based on the okay. way it's presented in the packet. Okay, right. that works for me, Councilmember Week. So, uh, so we'll move on to the proposed change for uh, mandatory business licensing. Uh, so, as a reminder, what our municipal code currently does is it requires that retailers be licensed. So that's typically somebody that you'll see driving down a road that is selling something that you or I would typically walk into and purchase something. Um, however, businesses, primarily service-based, still have a use tax liability, but everybody does have a use tax liability even if they are a retailer. So if you're <coughs> making online purchases or if you buy something from a typically an unincorporated municipality, there can be a use tax liability associated with that depending on what is being purchased. Um, the big reason to change, and um, I know I don't like being read to, but I am going to read this because I feel that it really hits home on why mandatory licensing is important. Requiring all businesses to be licensed will allow the city to know the number, type, location, and size of the businesses located in and doing business in Inglewood. This information can be used to provide important planning information to the city's policymakers. This information can be used for short and long range planning purposes to best serve the citizens and the existing businesses in the city, as well as to contribute to the safety and wellness of our residents. If we don't know that there's a business that's not zoned correctly operating, there's a reason why it's not zoned for that type of location typically and we would like to ideally keep everybody safe um, one thing that you had asked is for me to go to ACE as well as the chamber and share this information with them one thing that uh, ACE brought up and I think it's a very valid point is um, by having businesses required to be licensed it actually helps legitimize small businesses because it gives them that sheet of paper it makes them a real business. That helps when they're going for a loan or when they're trying to get business. That little, well, ours is a big piece of paper, <laughs> in a frame really does that for them. And it goes a long way. And it does mean a tax return, but you, when you're trying to start a business, anything you can do to get up and going and um, make you seem accurate and real and in compliance goes a long way. Um, Again, it goes back to confirming that businesses are in improved areas and are, and are in compliance. Um, this would also align us with other Denver metro jurisdictions uh, that have mandatory licensing. I believe out of the nine that we surveyed, only one did not have uh, mandatory business licensing for all businesses operating. Um, 
and then it would also contribute to the sustainability and infrastructure of Inglewood. If these businesses are operating here, they should be contributing to um, the infrastructure. They're using the roads, they're using the police, and you know everything that we have here to offer, which is a great city. Um, a few numbers uh, to, for you to look at. And these were in July. We have had an increase in licenses, I would say, since in the last four months. We definitely have, according to our tax technician, I don't have that exact number. Um, at that point, we had just under 1,400 businesses licensed with us. And according to the permit system that we have here, which is land track of commercial addresses, we had 2,200 that were not licensed. They could possibly be a business that should be licensed. It could be a plot of land that's a commercial address. We don't really know. We don't have the manpower to go out and check those 2,200 addresses uh, for this purpose, but there is that possibility. So it's something to think about that there, you know, is a variety of places that don't have a license currently. Um, after meeting with ACE and the chamber, as well as uh, discussing with Maria, and some other folks, uh, what I would like to propose for mandatory business licensing is that we require all businesses to be licensed effective January 1st, 2019. In addition, that home-based businesses with less than $100,000 in gross receipts would be exempt. This is an effort because we're not going after Grandma Pearl that is knitting mason jar covers for Christmas. We, we do recognize that there could be home-based businesses that are generating a significant amount of business out of that home. And so we feel that a $100,000 threshold is a good baseline for that. Another thing uh, that was brought up both by the Chamber and ACE is they thought that a three to six month amnesty period was pretty short. So we'd like to extend that to be a 12 month amnesty period, which I feel is very generous to give everybody um, a chance to get licensed and in compliance with us. We are uh, preventing, sorry, we are presenting, uh, we are presenting occupational privilege tax for information only. Uh, this is something that had been brought up by the Budget Advisory Committee. And so uh, we just compiled some information uh, for you folks to look at and just let you know how occupational privilege tax works just so that you're aware of that should it be something that is ever considered in the future. Typically an occupational privilege tax is imposed on both employees and employers that work within a city's boundaries. The money is typically designated to go towards a city's funds for police and fire responses to support that as well as other services as those cities see fit. It's able to designate new funds and diversify a city's general fund if they choose to. For an, for an example, we currently have five municipalities in the Denver metro area that have an occupational privilege tax. The lowest rate is Aurora and Greenwood Village, which has a combined $4 rate, and the highest is Glendale with a $10 rate. The most recent to pass, the occupational privilege tax was Sheridan in 2003, sorry, 2003, and it actually passed 114 to 358. And that was a Tabor question that they had to pose, so it did pass with their voters. Uh, may I just get some clarification on that chart? Uh, sure. The second column, the employee monthly gross earnings, is that the minimum an employee has to earn in order to yes. be subject to the tax? Yes, so they have to hit Denver. that threshold. Yeah. So um, in Denver, they have to hit $500 before they are withheld on. Thank you. We ran some possible scenarios just um, so that you have an idea of what it would look like. We ran the lowest, a middle, and then one of the highest. Um, the middle scenario, number two, is also an option if uh, possibly it was withheld only on the employee versus a split between the employee and the employer. And you'll see that's a monthly amount and then at the bottom we take it by uh, 12 months to get an annual amount. Some options that can be considered with an occupational privilege tax 
is what um, all the metro jurisdictions do, which is a split between employees and employers, have the tax applied only to the employee, which is what was shown in scenario two on the previous slide, a phased implementation between employees and employers so that it's not a hit to businesses right off the bat. Um, something that was brought to my attention when I was presenting to the chamber, approximately 95% of the employees that work in Inglewood are not residents of Inglewood. That equates to just shy of 900 employees of that 17, just shy of 18,000 employees that we were able to get from Data USA. So that means approximately 17,000 employees are coming into Inglewood to work and they are using the roads, they're using the police, they're using all of these resources and infrastructure that we provide. So this is a way for them to contribute towards that. My apologies, one more point of information. Did you say 95%, mm -hmm. just so that I heard Yes, 95% is what I heard, so that's just something to consider. Um, and something else that was brought up, and this is uh, kind of an information piece that I'm bringing to you from ACE and uh, the chamber is a concern of possible double taxation for Inglewood residents and so um, possibly offering an exemption for residents who vote in Inglewood just to confirm that they are an active Inglewood resident. Um, since the city clerk does voting, uh, that would be something that could be checked against voter records um, if they would like to claim that exemption. Um, just as something to think about since there was some concern with that. You mean Englewood residents who have a business. Yes. So if the voters I apologize. Choose, so then they would. Yeah. If it was to go that way, like I uh, mentioned, this is information only. But one thing that um, when I was presenting this to Ace and Chamber was a concern of double taxation for yes uh, residents as well as employees of Englewood that they are contributing via property taxes or you know their standard uh, sales tax that they pay when they go to the store. Um, that they would be essentially already contributing to fire, roads, all that stuff via that. So I thought that this might be um, something that would be an option for that um, since there is a large portion of people that come in. But uh, that's just some information uh, should you guys ever want to pursue it. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, are there any questions from council? We need direction and information. Um, Amy, I mean, Council Member Martinez. Um, thank you for this information. On the uh, business licensing, what would the process be like uh, for our staff to kind of go about um, getting all those businesses to apply for a license? Sure. What we would do is um, we would send out a postcard or an email address to um, businesses that we have an email address to or um, for the ones, those 2,200 that we don't have an, have an email address to, we'd likely send out a postcard, let them know of this change. Um, we'd uh, go to the chamber and let them know. Uh, we offer tax seminars. We'd be sure to put it on the website. Um, I'm on the next door, so um, I could have our community our communication person, reach out via that. Um, I would like to put something in the Herald. Really get out the word as much as possible so that everybody's aware of it. With having a 12 month amnesty period, it does give that time for everybody to get licensed and word of mouth, once somebody hears about it, they're gonna go, oh, hey, I need to get licensed or you know, there's, you know, this is gonna happen or that's gonna happen. And so um, we're gonna reach as many people as possible. If it comes down and there's just a few addresses we see that haven't gotten licensed. Uh, we have no problem going out and uh, knocking, leaving a card saying, you know, you, you need to contact me so that we can get you into compliance because we don't want to have a penalty or anything against you. Okay, so. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, I was really surprised the first time and this time to see how many businesses are could be unlicensed mm -hmm. compared to the ones that we currently have licensed. I think it could be a real benefit to the city and to the businesses. You know, the more we know what businesses are out there, we can help promote them and uh, let them know about all the resources available that we can help them with. So I think yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge benefit. Um, and I am a lot more comfortable with the 12 month amnesty period. I think that's a, that's a good amount of time. So Perfect. I'm in support of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor. So thank you for discussing this or the topics that we, we recommended you discuss with ACE and with the Chamber of Commerce in Englewood. Um, 
Is there more that you can say regarding the neutral position the chamber took regarding the standard definitions? Um, really, I, the chamber, they kind of seem for it, but they, I asked them to write a letter or maybe uh, speak with you all, and they said that um, they would let you guys know their stance, and so I don't want to speak something on their behalf if I wasn't 100% sure on it. That's just something I'm not comfortable doing. We did, um, I spoke with uh, the chamber and what we did, since they have so many members, I believe it was about 200 businesses are uh, part of the Chamber of Commerce. And so what we did in collaboration with the chamber is prepare a survey. And uh, according to the chamber, that went out last week. And so we should have those results soon. And so we uh, drafted 10 questions most of them were yes or no questions regarding um, are you aware of use tax? Are you a licensed business? It's completely anonymous so that we were trying to get a fill of this. Uh, it was more geared towards occupational privilege tax so that we could get a fill of that. But uh, we did try to encompass as many options as possible. And so um, we'll be getting that back. And when I get that from the chamber, I can again follow up and see if they would be willing to provide an opinion or something formal that I could provide you all regarding um, their stance about the standard definitions. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, I actually have a series of questions, so if you, if I may I, ask one more and if you want the rest of the I think go answer. ahead with the questions you have. I mean, we have plenty of time okay. this evening, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So. I did have a question regarding the deadline. I saw that the survey went out uh, um, and the deadline and when when the final submission date was so that we can have an as approximate date when we could have those survey results. But before I even mention that, I mean, there's three topics we're talking about here in this presentation. It's the standard definitions, the um, mandatory licensing, and then the OPT, the occupational privilege tax. Correct. So, are these? So, when I first read the packet, my assumption was that all of it, as I started to read, the mandatory licensing and OPT was a part of these standard definitions. But the standard definitions are simply um, revenue agnostic, just across the board for Colorado municipalities that make the business licensing or business revenue taxing. Mm -hmm. Etc. Simpler. Exactly. It is separate from OPT mm -hmm. and mandatory licensing. Correct. Yes, that is okay, correct. Okay, good. So, on point one regarding the standard definitions, the chamber was neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, ACE was in favor of it. Correct. Secondly, regarding the occupational privilege tax, um, ACE had reservations. You mentioned in yes. the packet. And then the chamber did request this survey. You administered it on November 12. So when was when was the final date for survey takers to submit? The, um, the chamber set that date, and they didn't pass it along. And they you don't were, know when that is yet. They okay. did not. They were trying to get it out last week, but um, I know with the holiday, it might have um, hit kind of a hiccup. And so I can uh, definitely follow up with my contact at the chamber and see what the status is on that. Okay. And do we have? So you probably, well, I'm g just going to ask. You might not know either, but I was wondering about an approximate number of completed surveys that we have already. Uh, I haven't I been provided that, that. Okay. I really wanted it to be completely anonymous, and I just get submitted the um, number of yes and no's. And then the tenth question was, do you have any additional comments or anything you'd like to share with us? So that if they're like, you know, you're crazy or, you know, I really like this idea or whatever, um, they had that option to share it and feel comfortable that it wasn't going to get back and they would have any retaliation um, measures, which would not normally, ha that's not something I would anticipate, but I wanted them to have that comfort level. So I really wanted to be as hands off as possible with the chamber other than just providing the questions. So they were setting up the survey and uh, they entered all of their email addresses. I just simply provided the questions. So I will, uh, I didn't want to be too pushy in regards to um, numbers and this and that. So. Okay, I just wanted aggregate numbers, which doesn't mm -hmm. have any individual data, just numbers. No, 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 I understand, but, it, but I, I feel it kind of goes with the, okay. the whole day. Having them me drive it. Okay, fair. And then, uh, so citizens would vote on that. And um, 
Was there any set of alternatives for the uh, being considered by the 26 municipalities yet to adopt the standard definitions that, that we might also consider for our citizens? Because at the very end of the packet, uh, we mentioned that no alternatives. Uh, Just to offer our citizens something else. To really, about, the standard definitions is something that um, wouldn't be voted on by the citizens because it doesn't result in a tax change. But um, the standard definitions is either we adopt them or we don't. It's pretty straightforward regarding those. Everything else is not as straightforward. The standard definitions are. Sorry, I meant alternatives to the occupational privilege tax. Oh, forgive me. No, 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 uh, not a problem. No, it's really just something that has been brought up previously. As um, I mentioned, the Budget Advisory Committee brought it up again recently, as well as um, I believe Council brought it up as uh, something they'd like to explore for possible um, generation of funds. And so I was just told to compile the information, and so that's why I'm here. Okay. And so it's really occupational privilege tax is kind of how it is. I, it could be structured however council would like. Right. Um, you could earmark it for something certain. Uh, you could uh, set the rates to be whatever you desire that you feel would be passed by the voters. It's really um, whatever you'd like to consider and the voters would pa uh, either pass or fail. So. Thank you. Thanks for mm -hmm. this presentation. I'm glad that uh, we're up to 63% or at least Maybe I have no opinion about it, but it's interesting that now 63% of um, our municipalities have adopted the standard definition. So mm -hmm. interesting to see that change since September 10. And I too would be in support of, uh, I'd love to hear what the rest of the council thinks, but I would be in support of the 12 month amnesty period for businesses for if we were to make that change. Okay, on the mandatory licensing, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Member Cuesta. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, the first question, and you may have covered it, um, there is not a fee associated with um, licensing your business, is there? Uh, we have a standard $25 application fee currently. That's not something that we anticipate on changing uh, with if we institute mandatory business licensing. And how do you guys define business? So you mentioned there's 1,300 some change licensed businesses and estimated 2,200. Mm -hmm. uh, who are these 2,200 um, businesses? How, how do you guys go about um, considering them a business? Uh, it is somebody that is operating not, they don't have a home. It's not obviously, they're not renting a house. But um, it's a business that, you know, they are in, they are in the process of attempting to generate revenue. Point of information, may I? I yes. think this might support Mr. Quest's question. So are we looking by chance at uh, registration with the Secretary of State? Don't all entities that are business have to register there? And wouldn't that in and of itself identify whether it's Amy Martinez LLC as a business? Yes, it sh they should hopefully be licensed with the Secretary of State. Um, we do find, I will say, we've had uh, pretty good success by searching if we have a name. Uh, you can't really search by address in the Secretary of State, I believe, but if we have a name of a business, we uh, typically are able to pull it up and look, at least based off of what is offered on the Secretary of State's website. Okay, thank you. Do you search the Secretary of State's website? Yes, I do check it on um, a basis sometimes when I'm trying to f uh, find an address or a contact person. Okay. In the course. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, if this were to pass, I believe there's an estimated uh, one million to one point five million that could be collected in use tax. Mm -hmm. um, now, we would only net of that one to one point five million seven hundred and fifty k. Again, estimated uh, because we would need to hire a tax auditor as well as two compliance tax. Uh, so, if we were using the one to one point five million, we only end up netting seven fifty. Uh, it would run us two hundred and fifty to seven hundred and fifty thousand for the compliance tax and the single tax auditor. Uh, that is our estimation with benefits and all. 
And if there's a $25 fee as well per uh, license application, that is not included in any of these figures of the one to 1 1.5 million no. that could be. Um, does it cost 25 bucks for somebody to go through the licensing process? I would definitely say so, given the amount of time that our technician has to spend uh, reviewing and making sure that everything's been submitted correctly and getting the account set up. I feel that $25 is um, a very reasonable amount to charge. Okay. Um, that covers it for now. I am curious about enforcement. I feel like many of the things that come before this council, they seem like great ideas, but then we reach a point where we say, okay, well, if somebody is not within the boundaries of what we consider compliance, how are they identified? How do we go about enforcing it? Um, I, you know what? I guess I will. I'll just complete that train of thought then. So people, let's say we, we pass this measure. People have one year to register their business. Mm -hmm. We hit the one-year mark. How would you go about identifying somebody that had not registered that we consider a business? Uh, what our effort would be at that point is um, to run the addresses that have been licensed versus what was available from the land track system, those 2,200, and that should narrow it down. And then at that point, the ones that we're left with, we would do further investigation on. Uh, the point of having uh, the two additional techs is um, I'd like to have one of those out doing street checks, face-to-face -face interactions, really trying to build that relationship with our businesses so that they feel that they can reach out to somebody, they can ask questions to, and, you know, when a new business moves in, they can um, let them know, hi, you know, you need to be in compliance, or when they see that a place is up for rent, they can speak with the landlord and be like, oh, you know, you might want to pass this information along with them. And with that, you know, there's also the option, I know ACE has a fabulous packet that they prepared. That's something, if we can get these businesses to license with us, we can also let them know about ACE and the chamber and all those type of items. So it really all goes hand in hand. And so ideally, um, those texts would go towards working on compliance. It's simply a manpower issue at this point. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Thank sure. you, Mayor Brooklyn. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Barentine. <clears throat> um, for the um, standard definitions, I am concerned every time it gets brought up, it's in conjunction with the legislation that went through and that only part of this did. So I would like to know what the rest of the legislation was, that this was kind of connected to that it, this was the part of, uh, if we could, if council could see that. And I would also, I, we've never been provided anything that at least gives an example of what a clarification would look like because there's 300 and 360 municipalities in the state of Colorado, and if only 60 of them are taking a look at this, I would like to know why the other ones have a concern about it. And so if we could maybe get some uh, things that would be clarified with it or things that would change with it as examples, then maybe we could get a better understanding of what the um, concern is, both for the state, uh, how it's causing them problems, and how it would benefit us to, to have this consistency or whether it would benefit us or not. Um, the occupational privilege tax, I'm, that's, I'm, that's something, I appreciate the additional information. That's something that we'll have to spend a lot more time on. The mandatory licensing, I think, is probably in the end going to be a, a, a good idea, but I think that a month is really tight on trying to push this thing through to make this, um, to triple the work, more than triple, uh, anticipating that you're going to more than triple the work of the business licensing department when the business license has already caused us, the business licensing process or lack thereof um, that we currently have has already caused us to be court twice. And um, if it wasn't for the fire marshal on both of those, we probably would have some additional problems on that. So when we're talking about the $25, whether that's an adequate amount of oversight or looking at the paperwork, I mean, so we're already having kind of some issues with the process that's going in there. And um, I think what she said, Council Member Cuesta, was that they had identified the other 2,200 by the track it, the land track that is correct. permitting. So they don't know that there's a business there or not there that's they don't know that there's business. It's, it's an anticipation on that. But even if I 
take these numbers, if you're trying to do something by January 1st, and we're five weeks away from that, and, and we're going to potentially triple the amount of work that's going into that uh, department, I think, is, is way too fast. And I don't think that that's um, even, that's hardly enough notice to council, let alone the businesses that we're going to start changing uh, this. The other concern is, is that you state here that all businesses are, are subject to use tax, and, and then you can't exempt home-based businesses. I don't know how you're going to be able to do that, but I'd like a little bit more information on exactly um, how we would exempt home-based businesses because I don't, I don't want to encourage people to take a business and <coughs> shove it into a home-based um, situation in order to avoid either the... Um, identification of the business uh, where they don't think that they whether they're wholesale or they're a service business and they would prefer that the government you know all of a sudden isn't recognizing them um, for a lot of small businesses uh, uh, they're not always uh, I'm, I'm not if, if small businesses so desperately wanted to be legitimized by government then they would be pushing for us to license them but that's not how this is happening so I'm going to I'm going to defer a little bit of, we'll agree to a disagree that I believe that small businesses are dying to be uh, licensed because they think it legitimizes them. Um, the um, concern then becomes on trying to kind of placate a home base business so that you don't have the uproar from the Tupperware pampered chef people that are doing their, their cards or knitting at home or whatever it is that's going on, and then having some of those middle-based businesses that are service industry, and we already have a lot of them in the community, and then kind of pushing more of those into a home base. I don't think we have enough time for until January 1st, and even with the 12-month <coughs> amnesty, I think that it would be a period of time that if the council needs to discuss this more and get this more out, to the community to get some information on the unintended consequences of these uh, processes um, that w we need to have a little bit more information. Um, I am not against licensing the business, so probably a, a good idea. It's been a, but the reality of it is we, ha we really have no idea how many we have. We really don't um, because we haven't been doing anything. And I think that, uh, I think this is, a, a huge push to do this um, in that short a period of time, and I think it will more than overwhelm that department that may already need some some um, has already had some issues and concerns with us trying to redo some things for them as well. Um, it would also be a good idea to council member request this point I think that we should get some financial information on the impact. Uh, and that's not prov that's not provided. While we may already charge twenty five dollars, um, if we're going to um, increase it that much, I think that we should be aware of the financial impact that we're looking at and the cost. Um, we don't collect money like this for nothing. There will be a cost, and I don't. We don't have anything that addresses um, what we think we're going to have for that additional. Um, piece of it. And then there is the oversight for that as well, because um, if businesses don't know that this is going on and there is going to be any penalty, we need to know up front all of what we're going to be doing to anybody before we institute it. it, it we can't just go, well, then they'll, they'll do it because they want to avoid the penalties and the fees and the stuff. No, we need to know what it is that we would be penalizing them, what's going to happen to them, because then businesses get mad when they don't when they have situations like that and they leave. So we don't want to encourage that either. So I think we're going to have to have a, a, a lot more information, a little bit more community outreach for the businesses to let them know what we're planning on doing so that nobody feels like they're behind the eight ball on this. And I mean, at, at best, I, th I think even for the department to get ready would be <coughs> at minimum trying to maybe look at March. I mean, if we could at least give it a quarter here try and figure this out and get some more information in there before we go try to institute this. Probably be wiser. I, I definitely understand what you're saying. 
Did you want to, would you repeat what you said in response to her because I didn't hear it? Um, I was just going to say I understand what you're saying regarding the timeline. Um, my thought was to start at the beginning of the year just so that it's a solid cutoff, but um, I, I definitely see what you're saying regarding that. So if I can, if I can say something. So, you know, the conclusion in the packet, we're really looking for this type of feedback from you. Um, regarding timing so this has been extremely beneficial and I I guess what I'm envisioning in in my mind is coming back with maybe a chart with a timeline that talks about a phased in approach and kind of what needs to be done along the way for you to to look at in another study session and so that we can move forward maybe in a phased in approach rather than saying we're going to start <coughs> doing this January 1 and I think I have an idea based on your comments, the types of outreach that needs to be done and discussions that need to be had regarding the mandatory business license. But what I, and I, I think what I heard on standard definitions is more information is needed um, based on how the definitions will be changed and how it might impact um, our, our, our our understanding of what those definitions are. Mm -hmm. Mayor, if I might clarify. Is that? Yes, you can clarify. Um, I, think, I think even if you just gave a couple of examples, because just saying we're going to standardize and clarify, that sounds great. And then later on you go, uh-oh, that's what it, ha what it does. So if we had some, at least some examples of, of what types of things would fall under that category of uh, standardization or clarification that would help me to understand the potential impacts that it could have and have better discussion about it and then the other would be uh, to make sure that we have an understanding of the kind of staff work that it would take for all for all three of these what is going to be included if we standardize and clarify the definitions what kind of how much work is that really going to take? It just doesn't go poof, and it happens. So I, I want to I want to get some idea of that same thing for the business licensing to triple the amount of work. That's that's amazing. That's incredible. So it's going to take more people. We ha we have to be realistic about it, and then of course enforcement, and then of course for the occupational tax as well. It's a cost to send the form out, follow up on it, you know, process stuff. So that would probably be another at least another department depending on how many people are there so we could get some information okay <clears throat> thank you i just i have a couple questions and then i'll defer to council thank member you, wink you're welcome um <clears throat> what are we currently collecting and how many um how many staff do we currently have in collecting that um and then one other question is, what are the net revenues we're already receiving from the businesses that we already have licensed? I can tell you regarding staff uh, for a, tech, a tax technician, uh, we have one of those. She deals with licensing, but also she sends out um, estimated assessment notices when we haven't received a return. Um, those type of items. So she does that, and then uh, we have the tax auditor that does the audit collections. And then there's me. So three? Um, there's three. We are in the process of working on our other auditor. Um, we're hoping that will be um, right around the start of the new year. And then... Um, I guess I, I wanted to um, refer you to a page in the October financial highlight that we're providing to you regarding the, the tax that we are collecting and the change um, just by adding the auditor so you can have an idea of what that is. Right, the increase is here. May I ask a point of clarification? Yes, point of clarification is fine. Thank you. So to the Mayor Pro Tem's question, independence of the auditor plus the two technicians that would be needed should we move forward on a whichever one of these three items that's listed in. Is this auditor that you're mentioning we're going to add to the team by January? Is this a separate individual than? Yes, it's actually um, in the budget. It was my previous position. And oh, right, we've because just, you um, right. had, it, okay. um, not you. the best luck filling it. So. Can I have a clarification on your clarification? <laughs> <laughs> so, you're at, so you're asking if the auditor that they're putting in was dependent on this piece of it or whether it was 
above and beyond something we would already do. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, we normally have two auditors. Ideally, I'd like to have a third if mandatory licensing was to pass. So right. that's replacing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Sure. And thank so, um, it's okay. I don't think there's any questions. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for that. And I, one thing that I would like to see is I would like to, <clears throat> to have a copy of the, uh, of the anonymous survey, what the questions are. And actually, I believe it would be good if council got all of the responses from that anonymous survey as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and is it possible that the, did you consider giving that same survey to the ACE committee? Um, I didn't. They hadn't mentioned it or ha expressed an interest, so it's not something that I had considered. But I would definitely be willing to. Uh, Actually, um, if you would do that, that and them. give them the opportunity, because we know they're all businesses, that, um, okay, owners, owners that are in there, and and I think that piece would help us move forward, especially with the um, mandatory licensing piece. Um, and I know we don't necessarily need direction on the occupational privilege tax tonight. This was more for information. Um, anybody want to weigh in? And I, I know Councilmember Wayne has her light lit, and I'll call in her next. But then I also would like for you to weigh in on perhaps the standard definitions if you want to wait till we get more information or whatever. Councilmember Wink. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So you'd like. You'd like us all to weigh in on the, our views on the standard definitions yes, in addition to whatever else I might right. want to say. Yes. So it seemed that the request was for updates to the standard definitions from the chamber and ACE, but what I read was that was regarding adoption or not, not regarding updates. So right. Well, the updates was anything that they heard here tonight. Do we necessarily oh. need that information before? Okay. That, that was a question that I just added. If, do you think we, okay. as a council, need more information on that? I but, think so. Okay. I, and then, thank you. So, Member Barentine mentioned something that clarified, that, that, that brought a need for clarification for me. So, regarding the summary, so very first page of our handout, <clears throat> Under the summary section, you do mention, so Member Barentine mentioned, in, in us talking about the 45 municipalities, uh, which I calculated to be 63%, because I assumed 45 plus 26 is the total because of the way it was mentioned here. Mm -hmm. But then Member Barentine brought up the total number of municipalities in Colorado, which is in the hundreds. And then I just looked on trusty Wikipedia, and there are 93 home rule cities and towns in Colorado, whereas the 45 plus 26 is 71. So it seems at the beginning of the summary section that you're specifically speaking about home rule municipalities. Is that true? I am speaking regarding the 71 is home rule self-collecting municipalities. And are there only 71 yes. home rule self connect So Yes, yeah, so those other... Uh, the total 300, if you take out the 71, those are uh, municipalities or jurisdictions that have their 21. state collected by the state. Okay. And so uh, they're reported on the state. They have to adhere to the state's um, exemptions and all those type items. So the 71 are, you can see on that, uh, the list of the ones that are on there, uh, Denver, you know, Sheridan, all kinds of jurisdictions. Maybe I'm the only one here. Maybe it's because I'm newer, but I feel that, I do appreciate everything you all do, but I feel I was guessing a little bit about numbers like that when I'm reading this and when, like, 45 out of this total or like, sometimes I feel the facts sort of fall off throughout the paragraph and... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. I thought I had... It could be me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, you know, um, I wasn't quite sure how to phrase it because when you start saying, oh, there's 300 and it, it gets... A, to be a lot of numbers, and so I was trying to just specifically refer to the self-collecting home room as well. Okay. So I apologize for that confusion. So we are looking at a total of 71. Yes, it used to be 70, and so then we do have 63 percent of those concerned mm -hmm. that have adopted the standard definitions. All right, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Uh, Councilmember Martinez. Thank you. I just have a question. On the survey that um, was sent out from the chamber, all of those questions are only related to the occupational um, tax, right? Uh, no. There are a variety. Um, let's see here. I can share with you all the questions. I have them. Um, one was, would standardized definitions across multiple jurisdictions be beneficial to you? Um, the first nine are yes and no questions. And then it was, would you be in support of requiring all businesses operating in Inglewood to be licensed? Do you have knowledge of use tax? Have you it assessed, that should have been accessed. Access, yes. Any of the available City of Inglewood resources, i.e. website, tax seminar. Would you be supportive of an occupational privilege tax? Would you be more inclined to support an occupational privilege tax if it was imposed on employees, only on employees? Would you be inclined to support an occupational privilege tax if it was designated for a specific use, i.e. roads, emergency services, graffiti removal, etc.? Would an occupational privilege tax of $4 an employee withheld from the employee's paychecks cause you to consider re relocating your business? Are you a business currently licensed with the city of Inglewood? Are there any comments slash concerns you would like to share with us? Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I think it'll be really helpful to get um, the aggregated feedback to hear from the business owners that these decisions are going to directly impact. Um, so I think for me, I would prefer to wait on any of these until we get um, more information from the business owners. But if we, don't, if we didn't have the survey and weren't collecting information, I would be comfortable going forward with the standardized definitions and the uh, business licensing. But since we are getting the information, we might as well wait and see what they say. Okay. Council Member Berentine. That, that's a good point. I think the chamber is doing pretty good with 200 businesses, but as the numbers just show with 3,600 potential and already 1,300 with a license, I think that, um, you know, that's just, so that's a really small fraction. So the, the, just trying to get the information out to um, just the chamber and ACE is enough work, but the, the rest of them I think would kind of get left out in the cold, so I'm glad that there's going to be some more time here. And the, the reason that I asked um, for what the standardized definition was originally attached to that failed, I think it's important. And I think it is important that we understand the difference between um, the statutory cities and the home rule cities and why there was a problem um, and the uh, the, I guess, and I may not have it correct, and that's why I want more information, the push from the state for it to be the collector and then regurgitate back money to us instead of it being collected. That's, that was my take on it. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be inaccurate, um, but this was tied with that, and so I want to make sure that we have that information so that we don't have misinformation on it and like I said, I'm more concerned about getting involved in something that may have unintended consequences that we can't take back afterwards and go, oh, that's why there was, <laughs> that's what, and you don't know until it's, in, until it's in there. That's why I just want more information on it. But that's why I brought up all of the municipalities and why there was, there, there just seems to be some reason that this got garnered off of there and I want to make sure it's not the camel's nose under the tent for what was originally in, intended um, because the state already has share of it and so uh, we, we certainly as does CML want to protect <coughs> the home rule cities um, and I trust them but I want to have the information so thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Cuesta would you like to weigh in on whether we need more time or more information? Or? Is this across all three uh, this is mostly for standard definitions and mandatory uh, yeah, licensing. I mean, we've gone this long um, without uh, having them updated. I, I think that having some first-name examples of this is how it could impact the rules. You, in that, you bet. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, but having some first-hand examples of uh, how it would change the language, for better or worse, I think it would be good for us to consider. Um, we've got five here tonight. Five here tonight. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, and you know maybe um, our other members might care to weigh in on this sure. one as well. So on this one, I don't feel a, a great sense of urgency, and some more information might not hurt. I do appreciate the presentation. I think it's definitely worth uh, further consideration. And how do we proceed on it? Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I agree. So um, I, if we could just come back with more information, and I, I think. Once we get more information, I think it'll be clearer for us. This, it's been good to have this conversation. It's becoming a little bit um, more clear to me as well. I, another thing that I would like for you to do when you bring forward the occupational privilege tax, again, is I didn't see the option on here of not um, of making it our larger employees, uh, our larger employers like perhaps people that have over 100 employees or over 200. I mean, what difference would it make rather than income-based? Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying regarding that. Um, and something that I considered regarding that is if we have an employee threshold that at this number of employees you're going to have to start withholding, our fear was that it would cause businesses not to want to hit that threshold because then it would become liable for the OPT. So we thought that might be a double-edged sword if we were to do an employee number. So it's just something that um, we felt, um, you know, the other five municipalities go um, gross monthly earnings base, and that seems a little more reliable. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely something we could um, possibly run those numbers and provide yeah. it to you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question. Okay. There were a lot of comments, and I've tried to take notes, but I think I'm going to need some clarification. So I'm going to try and capture everything that you've asked and talk with Dorothy, um, but I might be sending out some clarification just to make sure. Okay. And then secondly, um, would you want us to come back with each of these separately um, as study session? Because I think they're, you, you know, they're pretty big topics. We, you know, OPT is probably out into the future. Standard definitions is more critical. I mean, just based on the conversations that we had at CML, you know, there is a lot of um, interest in us actually moving forward with that as a city. Um, so maybe doing, you know, standard definitions in the very near term, then mandatory business licenses, and then OPT. I, I just, we've waited so long to come back. It, just because our agendas have been so full with budget and everything else, I. I'd like to not start all over again. Okay, you know yes. what I mean? Mm -hmm. yes, and, and, I, and I think if we piece them apart, it might help move at least something along. Okay. You know, and make sure that we're tighter on making sure we get all your questions answered. Does it? I, I think that's fine. And I think that, you know, when you get the information, actually the survey would go with all of them. So that information. And then um, since standard definitions are probably more important for how we do business as a city, I'm, I'm thinking that, um, you know, when you come back with that information that we just asked for tonight, I think that probably we would be ready to, to make a decision on that. I mean, uh, I, mean if I might, I just feel more comfortable as, as council member Quest has already brought up. We're missing uh, half of our leadership in another council member, and so I'm sure that the mayor and mayor pro tem can address when those things are coming. I am. I have no doubt that the mayor is listening. So I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they will be prepared once the survey is to to do that. But I don't think that we can say right. tonight. I, I mean, I just don't feel comfortable with that because the mayor, right here, and another council member. So exactly. And I took out of I took some good that. notes too. So um, can, good. That's all right. Councilmember Wink. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I, I want to make sure, are we leaving this conversation or this discussion with an understanding in terms of how we can better identify businesses in Englewood? Are there next steps? I, I don't want it to fall aside and I'm, and, and I'm uncomfortable moving forward with it as is. It's such a huge question mark. Um, it's, 2000, it's almost 2019. I would imagine we can ascertain right. more closely the number of businesses that exist. No? Right. I mean, this has to have been done before. Okay. I'm not the expert right now, but I mean... Sure, I, <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. What? I see Maria writing okay, down Maria more questions. Writing, so. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. I mean. Any other additional questions? And like, like uh, Ms. Sabota said, she will send an email to council if she needs more clarification okay. on things. So, all right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, would we like to take a break? Let's keep going. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I've had too much water today. I do apologize. Let's go. We can find a detox like after turkey. I'm, I apologize. You're going to right. have to give me five minutes. Okay. All Especially right. Especially after she says bath, and then I have to. <laughs> Did you have a nice Thanksgiving? I did have a nice Thanksgiving. I mm -hmm. just mostly relaxed. How about you? Yeah, we just, well, we went over to the kids, so I know we didn't have to do a whole lot. Stayed there for a while. And she just went home, probably about six of the dogs went home. So. That's what, this is our first well, thing. It's, it's, it's funny, like, mm -hmm. the boxes, it's nice to hear that. I heard you like that. Yeah, me too. It's good to get home. That's what. I mean, they're clean. All right, great. But anyway, I'm glad to see everybody else is coming in. I just fell on their face, too. Because we're going into this. Yeah. I've really been lucky. Words of commission. Yeah, so smile now. I'll have to like hurry up and transcribe these because I won't I won't be able to read my writing. <laughs> I'll be like, oh shoot! But you, it's on it's on recording, so you oh, could go back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's true. At least it's short enough that you could listen to it in like yeah. And slow it down. <laughs> <coughs> you know, yeah, kind of like just some people go. I thought getting married was a good idea too. You know, all right, let's do this. Until they do it. 
Is it time? Maybe I was all time? Twitter oh. when I found out. Is it time pregnant. to go? <laughs> okay. That was five minutes. I was happy until I looked at the end of the book. I, I looked at the little stages, and then somehow I flipped to the end of the book. Oh, oh, I forgot the thing's got to come out. <laughs> okay. So and I'm we'll to call this meeting back to order. Um, oh, I was going to say, he's put these down together. <laughs> the, the fourth item on the agenda is uh, the October financial report. Acting Finance and Administrative Services Director Maria Sabota is here to discuss the October 2018, 2018 uh, financial report. Thank you very much. Um, so you were provided with the packet, um, but I'll just note some of the highlights um, for you and take questions. Year-to-date revenues um, through October exceed expenditures by approximately $7.3 million. And I will say last year at this time, the revenues exceeded expenses by 3.6 million. So it was a significant increase. The revenue is higher than the budget by approximately um, 3.9 million. 91.6% uh, uh, of our budgeted revenues have already been collected with 83% of the year complete. Expenditures remain lower than budgeted, 76.4% um, uh, spent. And at this time last year, spending was at 83.3%. So those figures really all tied together to that first statement. I did want to point out on page three of the report uh, that the information provided for marijuana sales, as I'm starting to become familiar with the, the numbers, it's, it stuck out to me today um, that the 459,000 that was reported last month hadn't changed. Um, but it indeed has, so that was an outdated number, and it's just, it's removed from the general fund because we, um, that's right up above it, so the number in total is correct. It's just the marijuana piece, so one number would be lower, one number would be higher. So uh, because that's a, a number that you had asked um, be separated, I wanted to let you know that the marijuana number is $595,011, um, and it's based on cash col uh, collection for 10 months. Uh, so we will definitely make sure that that's updated going forward um, monthly. So those are the main things that um, you know I wanted to point out. Um, I'll just make one other comment. It, we had a question um, that was raised um, by Council Member Sierra regarding the block party numbers, and I wanted to really wait until the end of November to actually submit the response to the council request, but I can give you an update. Uh, just based on the information that we have through today. Uh, and it, it was updated as of today because it was a new invoice that was added um, just this week. Um, so the revenues for the block party right now, $5,515. And the expenditures um, right now, 22472 so um, I do have the breakdown of um, the revenues and the expenditures um, of, of where those funds came from. And I'll have to think of a way to put it together so that you don't have to have the whole list in the, right. in the response. And I will do that um, by major category. So some of those numbers, they, they could change, for, particularly on the expenditure side. I think we've captured all of the revenue. That hasn't changed. Um, but once the month is closed, I will send out the, the response to the council request with the final numbers final numbers because there still could be expenditures that trickle in, but that's a close estimate for now. Okay? Okay. Uh, thank you. Any questions or comments? Council Member Berentine? I, I just have one that kind of came up uh, as a result of last meeting with the Museum of Outdoor Arts. I made it pretty clear over the uh, last couple of years that I am against the City of Inglewood's ordinance where we charge nonprofits tax. So I brought that up when the Museum of Outdoor Arts was here um, and said, you know, I, how much tax are you guys paying? I mean, I don't think that that's right for a nonprofit to be paying tax. And they said that they would get that number to us. I asked uh, the interim CFO, is that your title? Is that officially your <laughs> Acting. title? Okay. Acting director. Acting, <laughs> acting, this, uh, yes, interim, Monday. <laughs> whatever verbiage there is for that, to go ahead after the last meeting. I made that a council request and said I would like to have, have that number, um, uh, especially since 
we play, they play in, we give them 100,000, we give them rent, you know, we don't charge them for the lights and so all this other stuff that we do. Um, but then we're charging them, ta I mean, that seems kind of silly. But then when I asked, when I went to reminder before the meeting, just, oh, don't forget, I, I don't know if I made that like an official council request or not. And then they said, well, uh, they would have to check with the city attorney on providing that information. So I would like to make the council request a official. Um, if they are a 501c3, I believe that they are not, um, uh, that there isn't any reason why the citizens of this community wouldn't know how much tax we collect from them or that they pay. Um, but if there is any issue that I would like that to just be an official request. Um, with all of the explanation that I just gave. I mean, we give away all of this stuff to them and then we charge them tax. I just would like to have that a little bit more explored and for all of the nonprofit entities that are being charged. But okay. And I just wanted to do it while you were here so that we could just at least make it public because I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot by reminding her of it separately because I was not aware that that would have been an issue that there would be any need to go to the city attorney for anything. So just to make it more public. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. And can I ask a clarification sure. question? Um, so it sounds like not only are you interested in, in MOA, you're also interested in other uh, nonprofit organizations. Is that a fair statement? Um, yeah, yes, I, I okay. am all, to, all together. Okay, so I mean, our school district, request. that issue's come up. Okay. But it seems almost the best example because it's somewhat ludicrous that we, like I said, we, okay. we give away all this stuff to them and then we're charging them sales tax when they're a nonprofit. And I don't even think, I think that's the one thing we shouldn't be doing and maybe we should be charging them the other. I don't know, but it's at least part of the discussion. But I don't know that until I know how much, I mean, what we're doing. Okay. And then you had also asked how much, it, and I, I've been asked this quite often about um, the, the sales tax figures for specific entities and it's my understanding, and again, it's based on talking to my team, um, whether or not we can disclose for a specific taxpayer what they have actually paid. And that's why we wanted to ask the city attorney's office if that is information that we can share. You know, in, aggr in aggregate, right, I just gave the revenue number, but I'm not certain that we can say specific to a business what they pay. So that's what I need clarification for. Not whether or not they're paying taxes, but exactly how much an entity so we will ask that question All right and there may be a difference with a 501c3 right. and certainly and somebody who's down. obligated to the city and to the taxpayers and the transparency that may have to happen with museum of outdoor arts or, or can happen because of their standing in a regular business that i that i don't know that i don't know because i know that the school well because all of that information came out so i don't know if they would be exempt so it's a good question to find out thank you Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments about the sure. budget? Council Member Cuesta. Uh, thank you. So on page three, uh, for the bank that was provided, we have the general fund expenditures on the second half. And uh, so for 2018, uh, the uh, expenditures total right now through October 18 were $36 million and some change that we've spent. And that's 76% uh, of the budget. Uh, one year prior, in October, we were almost at that same amount, $36 million spent, and we were at 83% of budget. Um, we're 10 of 12 months through the year right now, if we're using October, which is 83% of the year, which is exactly where October was in 2017. What is the difference there that we're at 76% now, 83% then, mm -hmm. um, but essentially the same amount of money spent? And I know there's a little bit more in the budget this year, but it's about a $1 million difference, and I don't think it's enough to constitute that uh, that we've only spent 70, I guess, how were they at 83% last year at that point? Gosh, I really don't know. <laughs> is one of them because it's a percent of budget and one is percent of the year, year to date? So one's percent of budget, one is percent okay, year to sure. date. That's correct. Um, but, but it is a fair question because we're tracking actually below that um, percent of year to date, I, I believe. Um, the quote, the number, uh, let me just look back here. 76 below the budget. Um, you know what, I thought I had quoted that. I'd have to get something for a minute. 
you'll just bear with me for one sure. minute. I just want to make sure. Um, yeah, you know what? I don't have that figure. Okay. I was I was hoping to to be able to tell you what percentage of the year to date we've spent. Like, right. And that's well, so on a follow-up to that, so for uh, the 2018, we've spent 76% of budget, and we are 83% through the year, end of October. So will we have, can we expect that to catch up and we'll get close to 100%, or are we going to have some breathing room at the end? So thanks for that question, and that's, that's the proper comparison, right? Um, and I think that's why we show it differently here. As, I, as you were answering the question, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of what we're trying to compare here and why we show percent of budget versus percent year to date, because what we're interested in currently are are there going to be funds that remain at the end of the year we're in the process of evaluating each of the department budgets we do know that we have an extra payroll in December so some of that some of that difference is going to be caught up um, but we are in the process of working with the department um, directors to figure out whether or not all of those funds that they currently have budgeted for the year will be spent um, I know that <coughs> we looked at the past five years and we have left the year with um, um, excess funds that actually go back into the general fund. They don't revert back into the particular budgets. They go back into their funds. Um, so I guess that's the best question, answer that I can give you. Um, I think we'll be a little bit closer, but based on my estimates, I, I would expect that there would be some, some funding left. Definitely. At the end. As I read it now, we're a month under budget, essentially, which is awesome as that worked out, although I understand the extra payroll in December. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And I have a question on, on page three also. The communications budget, it looks like we're only at 70.5% of the budget. Do you know why that is? I do not, but I can look into that for you. And as I'll make that a council request. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, the other thing, what, what is contingency for? So it's my understanding um, that there are funds set aside um, in the for folk and, and Dorothy might, might help me here, for individuals who leave during the year that have accumulated annual leave that they would be paid out, the funding for that actually comes out of a contingency account. And is, is that fair explanation Dorothy so is that why we're at 96 percent to date is because people have left and we've used more of the fund yes and it, it's a timing issue more than anything I mean I think you know I'll understand more of how it's budgeted going into next year um, but for that particular expense regardless of where if it's in a department a budget or if it's in a contingency line item for individuals that, that are planning to, to to leave that we're aware of, we would budget that. Um, and, and I think it's more timing that it's 96.9%. Okay, thank you. Interim city manager. Talk. Okay. <laughs> um, and I will say that that is how the contingency budget was um, funded and um, appropriated for 2018. Um, and was for, was for uh, leave payouts, oh, okay. um, not in the individual department budgets. But that is a question that uh, we've decided to, to consider. Would it make more sense to have reasonable estimates in each department budget and not use the contingency fund for that and save perhaps a smaller contingency for those under, you know, just what contingency would mean? We don't know about what, what um, expenses those might be. So that is a, an item that's up for discussion, and we'll certainly carry that forward and let okay. you know. All right, thank you. And I mean, I understood about the debt service um, being where we're at. The debt was probably already paid. That's why we're that high. So, okay, uh, Council Member Cuesta. Yeah, one more, and it's, it's just an observation. I know that uh, we're hoping to get a, a, a earlier jump on the budget this year, and I, I think that everybody wants to consider as many factors as possible and bring in some new information. 
Uh, you know, you mentioned the ones that are a little closer to their, their budget capacity. There's some well under, too. Um, you, you know, I would wonder, should we be considering that as we're setting up uh, budgets for the following year? There might just be one uh, particular reason that some of these are many hundreds of thousands of dollars beneath what has been allocated for them. But um, it might be worth looking at, do we need to justify as many dollars as we're setting aside? Um, I don't want to get to the point of use it or lose it. I once worked in an apartment that did that, and they did use it to the end, and they used it on things that maybe weren't the best. I certainly don't think that that's the case here. But I also don't think that we need that buffer in there if it's just not going to get used. Um, so just one more observation. I'm, I'll tell you what, this is definitely trending in the right direction, though. These numbers are great. Um, hopefully that they keep this far under. And then, again, I think we should consider these going into next year's budget as well. Some of these are just that far under when we get at the end of the year. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that's your goal, right, to consider this? It, it, really, <laughs> it really is as part of the budgeting process. Um, you know, every organization that I've worked for, you know, this, this is a common issue, right? Because you want to make sure that your, as your budget is as close so that you're using your funds for the most efficient and effective um, items that are promoting your strategy, right? So as we move forward into the budgeting cycle, I, I really want to work closely with the directors to identify what they're going to be using the funds for going forward and have it identified as closely as possible. And I, I do believe, you know, as, as much as, as everyone doesn't want to use the words RAD tool, I think that that's part of the purpose of the RAD tool <laughs> as well, but it's it's combining it, right? That's the challenge, right? Making sure that the line items are, are aligned with the RAD tool and you know what programs, how much programs are going to cost. And it, it truly is an alignment, and, and that's really what I want to work, work towards, so you're absolutely right. Thank you. Council Member Berentine. I have just two things. One off of what uh, Council Member uh, Quest has said, and that is that it's, it is going to, the, to be somewhat concerning if if we jump from uh, 20 to 30 percent under budget and all of a sudden at the end of the year everybody's at budget because they spent the money I, I, I guess then we'll find out that he that it was more of a use it or lose it attitude so I would expect that some of the, that that would be fairly similar at the end of the year um, and the other was why is there such a, a tremendous increase in the interest and I have one third question. I will look into that. Um, I'm wondering, and this is just off the cuff, right, because I, I hesitate to even answer it this way, um, but it could be the interest on the, um, the bond uh, for the police department. A hundred thousand dollars more? I, I don't know. That's that's what I'm saying I, because I don't know. I mean that's how they tremendous. I, I won't make you enter a, a, anecdotally. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> yeah. fine. But that's that's huge. That's a huge amount of money. So and if and and if that's the case, you better start sharing your investment strategy. <laughs> with some people. But, but if I could, but it could be a budgeting issue, not an act. An right. absolute increase, or it in could be both. Yeah, it right? could be both. So, yeah. so that's why you know I will I will ask um, the expert um, Jenny, and I'll make that a council request and make sure that we clarify how it was budgeted versus okay. how the actuals. Are being and then, bought. where does the rent for this building? What budget does it come out of? Oh, <laughs> I think you may have asked me that before, and I responded in the council request, and I can't remember the answer. So I will provide that for you okay okay because I'm still having some some trouble at least on the information that's provided on the uh, the um, east side of even seeing where that money's going into them so I'd like to maybe I could if, if somebody could show me where it's going out from us uh, then that would make it a little easier mm -hmm. okay that 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 council member time it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other uh, I was gonna say questions or comments? A good thing you didn't. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So uh, with that, we're to council members' choice. Um, who would like to go first? Me. All right. Uh, just while uh, Director Savada is here still. Um, Let me get my piece of paper back. Yes. 
So it's regarding something from earlier, but just something to take with you. One of our fine citizens uh, shared this valuable information. So in terms of ascertaining whether or not an entity is a business in the city of Englewood, uh, one, they should have an employer identification number, right? Issued from the state, the state of Colorado. Um, what? Thank you. And, and, um, and then a certificate of good standing, which is an annually renewed document. And uh, again, I don't know the details in a city or a municipality getting this information from the state, but, but those seem to be documentation you might want to you might consider looking into in terms of identifying businesses from what should be the source of uh, un unless there's a large percentage of individuals who just don't file those and still get I mean I um, it seems to me that so, that should work. So thank you for that information. I can speak from personal experience. Um, I actually registered a business with the state years ago and um, I decided not to do that, and so I don't issue the reports, um, but I still receive mail under that LLC that mm -hmm. I created. So I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it certainly would be a starting point to, right. to use as, um, you know, because Heather was saying, if we have the name, we can investigate it, and that would be a, na a way to get the name. The list could be, could be cumbersome, just based on the things that I just said, but. Definitely a starting point. So thank you for that. And then, other than that, n no, uh, no, no further comments from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Martinez. Sure. I um, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. And I was able to attend the Small Business Saturday kickoff. It was a, a nice turnout. It was nice to be there uh, at Earth Checks with lots of business owners. So hoping that um, event continues to grow. And then I have a question for our city attorney. You mentioned this last time at the end of our last meeting. I just want to make sure I understand the process on the vote with the ADUs. Um, so our next step is to vote on second reading, either vote it up or vote it down. And then if we vote it down, it's kind of a done deal. Um, but if we vote it up with the amendments and then we would like to um, look at it further, then we take um, that back to planning and zoning to start looking at it again, and then they come back with recommendations and we start that process again? Yes. First thing, and I've had several calls asking me for clarification, the first thing is ordinances passed by a majority of the body as a whole. Right. So it always takes uh, four, four votes to pass an ordinance. A resolution and a motion are passed by a majority of the quorum present. So those numbers can be different depending on how many members of the council are present. So that's the first thing about passing. Secondly, if whether this passes or fails, um, if council would like to direct staff to take any further action on ADUs, all they have to do is buy a consensus, uh, direct staff to go back and do whatever it is council would like to see. And then once staff were to do that, they would take it to planning and zoning, and planning and zoning would review whatever had been done, and then it would come back to council again. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to clarify, but make sure I understand. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, I happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Hope it was good. Um, tree lighting is this Saturday, and we got our tickets to the, uh, the North Pole event at Bellevue Park. Holiday Express, Holiday Express train. Holiday Thank you. Um, so uh, come visit District Four. My understanding is pretty close to sold out. I thought somebody told me. Totally oh, well, come visit District Four. <laughs> Thanks, guys. The lights are still visible. For there we go. <laughs> Councilmember Barentine. I know somebody we could head up for some tickets if we yeah, want to pay extra <laughs> money. <laughs> My wife will gladly swap me out. So <laughs> um, the, um, the concern about the uh, short-term rentals that we've had already um, came up to me when I was at uh, Starbucks waiting for some coffee over at, uh, at Quincy, and the overwhelming smell of pot I assumed it was coming from a business down the street and that they would no longer had their carbon filters on. Um, I, almost uh, immediately, 
after I made a comment about it, uh, three or four employees, including the manager of Starbucks, informed me that it was not. It was two short-term rentals that were behind them, two Airbnbs. And according to them, younger people that they are, I assume I know what they meant, they've been hotboxing it for three days there, and that's the way it smelled. And you could smell it in the entire neighborhood. So nobody, I probably wouldn't have been made aware that they were Airbnbs if it weren't for the fact that the entire neighborhood could, could smell the pot coming from the houses. Um, but uh, when these things are popping up, like the one on Washington, the one in the old Masonic or uh, shrine building there, uh, and we're well aware that we've got a Airbnbs going on. Somebody told me that you could look it up, and, and there's, they claim uh, uh, close to 100. I don't think there's that many, but if we've really got this many and they're causing problems in the neighborhood already, and they're not legal, um, I'm a little concerned about the enforcement. So if we could kind of check into how we're enforcing this, I have a feeling, um, at least from some of the comments that are being made, that the city <coughs> seems to be taking a stance, or at least it, it appears to people that they're taking the stance that since it's being talked about, that somehow they're turning a blind eye to this. And it's, it, it's concerning. And unfortunately, it added even more concern to people about ADUs, that uh, the short-term rentals are currently not legal, and we don't seem to be able to enforce them, and how we're going to go ahead and enforce ADUs once we put them in with that long list of whether somebody's living in their house for that period of time starts to become more of a concern to people. I had an overwhelming um, sigh of relief from people that this council is going to go ahead and uh, take a better look at ADUs, especially for residential areas. They're very concerned about that and this push of uh, just continuing to, um, to densify their area and take away their community. So um, they said to tell you all thank you, that that's the way they, had, where they were happy it went that way. And, hope it at least goes in smaller stages, and if it's good, then that would be great. And if we could please take a look at enforcing our law uh, currently, um, if somebody has an Airbnb currently and they don't take up somebody's parking, they don't have bachelor parties and, and wild things going on disturbing people, you can't smell pot for the entire block of a place, nobody would even know it was an Airbnb. The only reason people are having problems with it is because people are being inconsiderate and bad neighbors and disrupting somebody else's ability to live in their home. So if we could enforce the law we currently have, I'd appreciate it and look into that. Okay, so that's a council request? It is. Okay. <clears throat> is and that it? And the other is, of, of course, the um, there are some permitting issues going on, which I think I shared a little with the business piece of it. And I'll try to get a little bit... Uh, I'll, I'll get that a little bit more together so that I'm not outing necessarily a particular property until I know for sure exactly what's going on. But um, there's got to be a way for us to try and take a look at how we how we do permitting, whether it's like the construction issues that uh, the, the uh, Lacto Miller's brought up. You know, you've got right-of-way permits that should have been issued and are being taken up. Um, and, and how we do that, maybe that's something that we'll need to have the council address in the future. And then again, I would like to request that um, how we advise the supervisory committee uh, be put on the agenda for this council. We okay. have done so. <coughs> Tim, oh, yes, go ahead. I forget the exact date. Oh, but, okay. Um, the mayor All right, I hadn't hand. seen it on there, so I just... Yes, we talked about it. Thank you very much. Time. I appreciate okay. that. All right. And tell Linda thank you as well. I'm sorry, the mayor as well. Thank you for okay. making sure that got on. Okay, thank you. Um, and on my council member's choice, um, I want to bring up too, December 1st is the, uh, I call it the Christmas concert and the, the tree lighting. Um, we'll be here at City Center starting at three o'clock is the setup but the concert actually starts i think at four and goes till 5 30 and then the tree lighting will be at 5 30 so i would encourage you all to come and the truth is i um 
if you're all there whenever um, we come up just before the tree lighting if you all would come up um, also because I want all of us to be introduced not just me because I'm filling in for the mayor so if you would all make your way up there to the front that would be that would be great we have to sing you have to sing no <clears throat> but I have heard uh, actually that'll clear the crowd <laughs> <laughs> if I start to hear anything <laughs> Randy Penn I did uh, there is a, a church coming to sing for about 20 minutes and um, they he wanted to know if they could lead perhaps a couple Christmas carols where um, everybody could sing so so anyway I'm I think this is going to be great and and then we'll talk about the holiday parade next for next year. We have to start early. It's Renaissance. We can come back. The okay. Break. All right. Great. I didn't hear you're coming. I'm no. Sorry. A, a Renaissance of the Christmas parade. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, city manager's report. No report tonight. Thank you. City attorney's report. No report tonight. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>